Ashman is a full-blooded Cherokee doctor and a shaman. He meets Casey, and that's when the whirlwind romance starts. But the couple has to overcome a jealous ex-fiance before they can be together. Will their love endure, or will it end just as quickly as it started? Hello, I'm Keisha Young. Today we'll meet the author of The Medicine Man Book 1 and its sequel, Medicine Man Book 2. Both are Amazon bestsellers. We'll find out what inspired her to write these best-selling novels. Then we'll learn how she got into the writing industry. And she'll give us tips on getting published and disciplining ourselves to write. All that and more when we return with Writer's Cafe. Stay tuned. Well, me and my lady had our first big fight So we drove around till I saw the neon lights A corner bar <laughs> Not a soul around but the old bar key What can I get for you, man? Better life than the one I got but He walked up and said, what Like me? that one I said, the good stuff. Hey, wasn't always a perfect picture But there were some perfect parts <laughs> Cause it's the first long kiss on a second date Dropping the ring in the spaghetti plate Cause your hands are shaking so much And it's the way that she looks with the rice in her hair and Eating bird suppers the whole first year And asking for seconds to keep her from tearing up Yeah man, that's the good stuff A message from the Foundation for a Better Life she never believed she was a good writer until her teachers told her so. Even then, she didn't believe them. They must have been right, because now she's a four-time Amazon number one bestseller. With us is author Beverly Chaloni to tell us about her early years as a writer and the people who helped her recognize her talent. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for asking me to be here. Oh, you're so welcome. So what's your earliest memory as a writer? I was about maybe nine years old, and I had a pink toy typewriter that actually worked. Mm -hmm. So I remember banging away on it oh. from a very early age. Oh. Did you take any writing classes when you were in school? Just uh, the regular English classes in high school and college. I excelled in both of those, and I'm probably the only person who actually enjoyed getting writing assignments. Oh, so like no creative writing classes? No. Were they offered? Um, in college they were, but I decided not to pursue that route. So what kind of books did you read as a child? Um, I read the normal books like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, mm -hmm. Three Little Pigs, and my mother told me that one of my absolute favorite books was a book called Mr. McGregory's Garden. It was about a farmer who was irritated with the bunny rabbit who kept getting into his vegetables. Oh. So when did you realize that writing was your passion? Um, probably not until my 20s, and I had been writing all throughout high school. But in my 20s, it really picked up. I mean, I would go through packs of loose leaf notebook paper like it was nothing. And I would oh, really? write every day. So you say that you began to realize your talents in your early 20s. What made you realize? Well, I had enjoyed writing in high school and it just stuck. So I kept writing in my 20s and also in my 30s. I've just been writing for as long as I can remember. So do you remember who your favorite authors were growing up? Um, my very favorite book was Black Beauty by Anna Sewell. And I also read 20,000 Leagues Beneath the Sea. That was one mm -hmm. of my favorites. And Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. <laughs> How did those authors influence writing? I really don't think that they influenced my writing per se. I just mm -hmm. enjoyed reading. So my mother used to say I, I would read anything I could get my hands off. Can you tell us about what your teachers thought of your writing, like when you were in high school? All of my teachers told me that I had potential, and my very last English teacher that I had in my senior year wrote in my yearbook that she wanted to see a book out by me in the near future called oh. Love's Last Lingering Look. Oh. So did your other teachers say anything else that you remember? Um, my, actually, my typing teacher uh, had commented on my writing ability because we had an assignment to do an essay on the typewriters and she was just blown away by what I wrote. Oh really? So she was supportive as well. Did anyone else notice your talents? Like family or friends? Um, not at first because I tended to keep my writing private. Not until I got older did I begin to feel comfortable with sharing it with friends and family. Okay. 
So you start taking it seriously in your 20s and 30s, you say, what did you do to, you know, hone in your writing skills? I wrote every day and I would go to the library and just get stacks of books and take them home and read. And really? I think that really helped influence the decision to write what I write, which is usually romance. Did your family and friends support you being a writer? Were they pro-writer or anti-writer? Once they found out, yes, they were. They, they were? were very supportive. That's good. So you say that you were writing like anything and everything. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you wrote in those early days? Um, I wrote poetry. I wrote a lot of poetry in high school. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote the essays, and I was always working on some kind of story, but I usually kept those private. Oh, really? So, yeah, a little bit of everything. Well, that's good. So you were writing like on a daily basis during this time? Mm-hmm. Like an hour to, at a time? Sometimes. When I was in school, it was hard to do that because, of course, you know, I, I couldn't mm -hmm. stay up too late, but when I was in my 20s, yes, I could sit there and write literally all day. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when did you start sharing your writing with people? Um, not until maybe my late 20s to early 30s. And once I did share it, I was uh, amazed by their reaction. You know, they actually seemed to enjoy it and told me I was a good writer. Mm -hmm. So that made me a little bit more comfortable with sharing my work. With so them. who were some of the first people you shared your writing with? Some of the very first people I shared my writing with was, well, my first husband and his grandmother. She also wrote. Once she found out I wrote, she was very encouraging and supportive. Um, one of the men that I dated in the past, I shared it with him, and he liked it. And, of course, some other friends. Now, were there people encouraging you to like share your writing with the public at this time? They were telling me that it was good and they liked it, um, but the decision for me to try to go public with it was one I made on my own. Well, what made you want to pursue an actual writing career? I had written for so long and I realized that it was something I really enjoyed and I started thinking, well, maybe I'm good enough to actually get published. Maybe I should give that a try. Well, thank you so much for being here. You're quite welcome. Thank you. After these short messages, Beverly will read an excerpt from her best-selling novel, Stay Tuned. Everybody needs a helping hand. Take a look at your fellow man and tell me what can I do today. Uh, hey, let me get that for you. Thank you, young man. No problem. Courtesy. Pass it on. Don't worry about me. I got it. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Casey's health, life, and relationship with Ashwin are up in the air. And Medicine Man Book 2, Ashwin's jealous ex fiance Silver Moon, threatens to ruin his romance with Casey. With us is best-selling author Beverly Cialoni to tell us about her two Amazon bestsellers and how she found a publisher. Well, first thing, sorry, would you like to read us an excerpt from your book? Of course. Okay. This is an excerpt from book one of The Medicine Man. At first, Casey thought she was dreaming, but as the dream became louder, she frowned and opened her eyes before she realized that her parents were arguing once again at three in the morning. She wearily sat up and rubbed the sleep from her eyes as she listened to her mother's raged yet muffled voice, and she was a bit surprised to hear her father start yelling. That was something he rarely did, and Casey frowned and chewed on her bottom lip as she tried to decipher what they were arguing about this time. After 15 minutes of hearing her parents arguing, she shook her head and got out of bed before she pulled on her robe and cautiously opened her bedroom door. She walked through the living room and stopped just outside the guest bedroom's closed door. As soon as she placed her hand on the knob, her stomach twisted in icy fear as she heard her mother shrilly exclaim, John, where did you get that? Casey's father mumbled something, but her hand was frozen on the doorknob as fear settled like an icy lump deep in her gut. Moments later, the fear enveloped her entire body as she heard her mother scream, John, what are you doing? John, no! A single shot rang out. Casey threw the door open as an icy dread filled her heart, her mind. 
Her breath became lodged in her chest as she took in the scene before her. Her mother's body was sprawled across the bed, her blood splattered on the wall. The once pristine comforter was now crimson, with shards of her mother's skull and dark clumps of blood-soaked matter making a crazy polka-dotted pattern. Casey's mouth was slack with shock as she slowly turned her head to meet her father's gaze. Her father turned to look at her with eyes that were surprisingly clear and coherent before he gave a sigh so deep that his shoulders heaved. She watched in horrifying slow motion as her father toyed with the gun in his hand. Finally, he looked at her and murmured, I love you, baby, before he put the gun into his mouth and pulled the trigger. Casey staggered backwards as if she was the one who'd been shot as some of her father's blood and brain suddenly flew into her mouth. She screamed as her father's thick, warm blood clogged her throat before she gagged and became violently ill. Tears burned her eyes and blinded her as she fell to her knees, gasping and crying and shaking as she crawled on all fours, desperately trying to find her way out of the apartment. She made it as far as the bedroom door before she finally collapsed and immediately sank into the merciful oblivion of unconsciousness. A single scream ripped through Ashwin's brain, rudely pulling him from a deep sleep. He sat straight up in bed, frowning as he glanced around the dark, familiar bedroom. He sat there for a few moments as the initial thundering of his heart finally slowed, fully expecting his mother to come frantically knocking at his door. As the seconds ticked by, though, the only sounds he heard were the soft whoosh of the ceiling fan blades above his bed and the distant lonesome cry of a whippoorwill somewhere in the forest. Yet there was something about that scream that troubled him deeply. As he sat in the dark stillness, realization slammed into his mind with frightening force. Casey. It had been Casey's voice he'd heard in that agonized scream. Something was horribly wrong, and in that instant, he knew what he had to do. Oh, wow. That was intense. <laughs> well, it's good, though. Thank you. You're welcome. So can you tell us what inspired you to write this book? Uh, I was actually on vacation in Myrtle Beach, mm -hmm. and the hotel we were staying at had a side view balcony. So I was sitting on the balcony one day, and I just happened to glance over and notice that I could see people sitting on their balconies at the hotel next door. That's when I got the idea to write this, because initially, Ashwin and Casey see each other. He lives in one apartment and she lives in the other just like it was set up when i oh. was on vacation <laughs> how long did it take you to write this book it took me a little over a year to finish it oh really so can you tell us about when you got the call from your publisher saying that your book had been published i actually submitted the manuscript to her and she called me that same afternoon to tell me that she loved it and offered me a contract for it oh that fast yes wow so can you take us through the steps of finding a publisher? Uh, finding a publisher can be uh, a tedious process, especially if you don't know what to look for and what to avoid. Um, with the internet, of course, all the information is out there. Um, the first thing I would suggest is when you're looking for a publisher, there are what they're called vanity presses, publishing houses. They charge you to publish your book. They make no guarantees for your success. Um, you should probably stay away from those as they ask for a lot of money up front. Anyone who asks you to pay for their publishing services, you should be extremely wary of. A legitimate publisher like the one I have will never ask you for money up front. Although some publishers may charge a reading fee, but they are very few and far between. Okay. So can you tell us about a moment where you were discouraged while looking for a publisher? I had actually done what I just said. I went to the internet and looked at all these different publishing places. And of course, the ones that wanted a lot of money, well, that was out of the question. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that... They offer a contract with a price, of course. So I went through a lot of research on the internet, and the more I looked, the more discouraged I became because it seemed really? like they all wanted a lot of money. Well, what do you think makes a good publisher? A good publisher will accept 
more than just one genre. A good publisher offers variety. A good publisher is there for the authors that they represent. Um, a good publisher will keep their word. They will usually take care of the editing, the book cover designs. They will let you know when your book is coming out. They take care of putting your book up on the different sites. And if it's just an ebook e format, a lot of publishers also offer what they call print on demand where you can get paperback copies of your book. And I do have some paperback copies coming soon. So a good publisher is all of these things. And like I said previously, they should never ask you for money up front if they do run. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many publishers have you had over the years? Two. Just two? Mm -hmm. How did you meet your current publisher? I was on Facebook and a friend had posted the link for my publisher's website. And on a hunch, I clicked on the link, spoke with the publisher briefly on online and I submitted my manuscript and like I said she called me that same afternoon and offered me a contract. Now was this friend also an author? Yes she was. How did your family and friends react when you told them that you signed a contract that oh, they quickly? Were, they were ecstatic they were uh -huh. very supportive. What was it like to finally get the perfect publisher after all the hunting and researching? After all of that and after my first publisher which I will always be grateful to her for putting my work out there. But the publisher I have now, she is completely awesome because <laughs> she's she's just supportive of my work. Whenever I have a question for her, she always answers it and she keeps her word when it comes to my books. So can you tell us a little bit about your very first publisher? My very first publisher, I met her in 2009 online. Um, she was a small startup. I submitted my work to her and she took it. Um, however, when I was with her, I knew absolutely nothing about book marketing or promotion. My current publisher has taught me a lot regarding that and I feel that's one reason that the Medicine Man books have been so successful. Really? So what was the very first book of yours that ever got published? The very first book that I submitted with my first publisher was called Coming Home. It was about um, a girl whose parents had died and a man she had been involved with several years earlier, just happened to see it in the newspaper. And he flew to be with her, so they reunited and developed the romance from there. So how did it feel seeing your book published for the very first time? It's awesome. I think <laughs> any author, any author is excited to see their name on their work out there. Do you have any advice for authors who are looking for publishers? The advice I can offer is find a publisher that is supportive of what you write. And like I said, you should never have to send the publisher money up front. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. You're quite welcome. When we return, Beverly shares some tips for anyone looking to get their work published. Stay tuned. Dude, you thinking what I'm thinking? Yo, I'm gonna cut the gap. Yeah. <laughs> <Sweet>. <laughs> I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna get it. I'm going in. <laughs> Integrity. Pass it on. Save the day. <laughs> a message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Amazon bestseller Beverly Cialoni signed with Imaginary Publishing in December of last year. With the help of her publisher, Tabitha Faith Barto, she's been catapulted to the top of the bestsellers list on Amazon four times. And now, best-selling author Beverly Cialoni shares advice for aspiring writers and authors. Well, thank you for being here. You're quite welcome. So, what are you working on right now? Right now, I am working on a couple of books. One is Top Secret. Top Secret. <laughs> um, one of the other books I had been working on before I started writing The Medicine Man was a book that actually features a female race car driver and is set here at the Lancaster Speedway. So I've um, been working on that. I have to go back in and make a few revisions and add some more to it, but it should be coming out soon. That's good. Also, my uh, current publisher is going to re-release the books that I had with my other publisher. So. That will be some other books that I'll have coming out. Well, that's great. So what inspired you to write this one about the female 
race car driver. I am a die-hard dirt track racing fan. Really? And as many times as I had been to the racetrack, I started to get the idea that, you know, well, maybe it would be interesting if I made a book about a female race car driver, since there doesn't seem to be many women, if any, racing at the Lancaster Speedway. Well, that's good. And so you say that you're almost done with this one, just a yes. few revisions? Mm -hmm. So when do you predict that it'll be published? Um, probably within the next couple of months. That's good. So it seems that like you get your inspiration to write based off the things you know and what you see. Is mm -hmm. that true? That's true. Do you think that's the best course of action for authors to take? Uh, I'm sure that everyone has heard the old adage, write what you know, mm -hmm. which that's good advice, but everyone should expand their horizons. It's safe to write about what you don't know as long as you do adequate research. So how did your publisher react when you told her the premise of this new book? Oh, she's just thrilled with anything that <laughs> I want to put out because really? she just, she loves the Medicine Man books. So she's supportive of all of my writing. That's great. So how often do you write nowadays? Um, when I was writing The Medicine Man, I wrote almost every day. Now I write when I can find the time. Really? Mm -hmm. So how many more books would you like to publish in your lifetime? As long as I keep getting ideas, I'll keep writing. <laughs> now I know that writing isn't your main career. I know you have another job. So can you tell us about how you balance writing and your other job? Sometimes it's really difficult. My work schedule varies. Um, sometimes I'll work five or six days a week. Sometimes I work two or three. On the days that I do work, when I come home, I'm just really tired. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't feel like writing. But that could really be the downfall of any author if they give in to that. You have to write whether you feel like it or not. So what advice would you give to someone who's in your same position who has to balance writing and another job? You have to make time to write. I think all writers have to sacrifice something, whether it's sleep, family time, or a TV show or a movie that you wanted to watch. If you really have something that you want to get out there, you have to put in the time to do it. And do you have any advice for people or writers trying to break into the industry? Hone your writing, do your research, just write, 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 pay attention to your surroundings, um, just, the minute details because it's the small things that really make a book great. So do you have any advice for, I guess, younger writers, like high school level writers? If you're really interested in a writing career, try to do your best in your English classes. Mm -hmm. Go to the library, read everything, anything that interests you. Write, write when you're at home, keep a notebook with you, write down ideas, write down descriptions when you're in the park, write down how the birds sound, how the grass looks, how the trees look, anything. Now, is the writing industry, is it like a competitive market? Oh, yes. <laughs> There's just numerous authors out there, too many to count worldwide, and a lot of them have been successful. A lot of them are trying. Um, I do believe that the indie writer market is already large and it's only going to expand. So how do you think a writer can make himself or herself stand out? They have to hone their writing. They have to make sure that they write the very best that they can and they also have to do their research. They have to know what they're talking about because if they write something just on a, on a whim and it's not correct, if a reader sees that, the reader will know. And once the reader feels that the writer is not legitimate or doesn't know what they're talking about, that's going to be a death sentence for the writer. So what other things are damaging for a young writer? Um, distractions, um, being careless with their work. I am a stickler for proper spelling, punctuation, that kind of thing. So you have to make sure that you write almost perfect, no one's perfect, but try your best to make it flawless. And how can a writer get to that level where a publisher will look at them and notice their work? They have to make it interesting. Every book has a beginning, middle, and end. Every book has to have some kind of conflict. Every book has to be able to draw the reader in and make it interesting. Thank you for being here. You're quite welcome. That's all the time we have for today's show. 
For more information on Beverly Chaloni's books and full-length interviews, go to the addresses on the bottom of your screen. If you have any suggestions or comments, please contact us at the address on your screen or email us at learntv at I'm Keisha Young, and we'll see you next time on Writer's Cafe.